Yes. The webinar is being recorded automatically as well, so we can now um, let people in. As a matter of all right. On behalf of Glodem, I would like to welcome you all to the launch of our new virtual book talk series named Glodem Book Club. Uh, beginning this month, our online book talks will feature leading scholars from around the globe discussing timely issues related to globalization, political economy, peace and conflict resolution, democratic governance, um, which are topics that uh, we study at, at GLODEM. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Sun on his latest book, Certifying China, the Limits and Trans of Limits the rise and limits of transnational sustainability governance in uh, emerging economies. Um, before I give the floor to uh, Dr. Sun, I would like to also um, give a short bio. Um, so Dr. Yixin Sun is an assistant professor, a lecturer in international development at the University of Bath. He holds a PhD in international relations slash political science from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. And he was a postdoc fellow at Yale University before joining University of Bath. He has been a research fellow of the Earth System Governance Project and uh, co-convened the um, Earth System Governance Task Force on SDGs. He's also an associate editor of the journal Global Environmental Politics. Dr. Sun studies transnational governance, environmental politics, and, and sustainable consumption. Uh, his work has been published in well-respected scientific journals, including Ecological Economics, Global Environmental Change, Global Environmental Politics, Nature and Food, and Review of International Political Economy. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Sun and um, maybe ask the question of, um, can you talk about your book a little bit to us and, and we'll take it from there. We'll have some uh, questions on your book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. And it's my great pleasure to be here. And why you invite me to um, join this webinar series, I didn't know I'm the first speaker in the whole book club. So it's it's really my honor to, to kick off this uh, uh, book club series. Let me just share my screen. And I'm going to give a, a presentation and just a very succinct of summary of my book and hope that can answer uh, the first question that you asked about what's the book about. Um, can everyone see my screen? I, I believe so. So let me just... Uh, all right. So as you can see, I'm going to talk about this book, which is uh, published last month, end of February, actually still uh, brand new uh, by the MIT Press. Um, the title is Certifying China, the Rise of Lim and Limits of Transnational Sustainability Governance in Emerging Economies. Now I have my book here, it's still, yeah, unbelievable that you can hold your own book. So yeah, I'm still very excited. I'm so happy to, to share uh, what the book about today uh, with all of you. Uh, let me start with uh, my motivations. So when I started my PhD um, in 2000, 14. Um, so actually, uh, I met Mary and during my uh, postgraduate study in Geneva. So I, I got interested in uh, this transnational turn in global environmental politics or governance, which refers to the rise of uh, uh, institutions or, and rules or standards uh, developed or led by non-state actors, including businesses and NGOs, uh, to address many sustainability challenges. And one of the most studied, uh, uh, most studied studied um, transnational governance is uh, the so-called equal certification programs. Um, they are voluntary um, standards or certification schemes uh, without the use of the state uh, sovereignty. Also, in many cases, they apply a multi-stakeholder rulemaking processes, and their, the compliance of their rules must be verified 
often through third-party auditing. And because of these features, these programs uh, um, were expected to deliver faster solutions than tra traditional uh, multilateral uh, institutions or negotiations to address uh, many cross-border sustainability challenges, especially environmental problems. And, and this is why people uh, had a very high expectation to this type of new governance model. However, if we look at the uptake of um, certified products uh, across uh, the globe and in many commodity chains, we could see a huge discrepancy between uh, the global north and the global south. And uh, if we take into account the change or the rapid change in global economy, this, especially the, the shift of the, the center of the global economy, from the global uh, north or the west to emerging economies, emerging markets, especially the BRICS countries, um, we would wonder what are the impact of this program in those new markets. And if they want to be impactful to solve some global problems, they have to get support in those countries. So this is my initial motivations to study. And in that sense, China as the largest emerging economies presents a critical case um, so I want to know uh, to what extent uh, ecosatification problem get traction uh, in China. And therefore, my central research question is what are the economic and political forces that can drive the entry and growth of transnational ecosatification in China? And as a political scientist, this question gets even more interested uh, if we take into account the, the political context of, of, of China, the so-called the authoritarian context. Uh, therefore, uh, although there, there was very little research, so most the scholars on transnational governance or ecosatification more specifically uh, had a very pessimistic um, expectation about the, the prospect of this governance model in China. And mainly because the state strict control over the civil society, which leave very little space for NGOs to advocate uh, non-state governance. Uh, but also, if we look at the data in terms of the consumer demand for sustainable products, it seems that the, the consumer awareness of sustainability impact of their consumption remains really low. Therefore, I think I believe there was an urgent need to, to conduct empirical research in a systematic way um, to understand under what conditions uh, transnational eco-certification can um, get traction in China. So to do that, I need to develop a theoretical framework. So my theory uh, has two starting points. The first one is that the transnational governance operates between markets and politics. Uh, this means uh, that these governance programs are not solely developed by non-state actors as a way to address some collective action problems in the market. In that sense, the state actors can always intervene with their own vested interest. And therefore, we need to take into account the interactions between the market and politics. Um, and secondly, and relatedly, transnational governance does not land in a regulatory void in terms of their operation and impact. And that means they have to be grounded in the institutionalized governance processes of host countries. In, from this perspective, what we need to understand in the case of China is try to identify what, um, who is likely to influence the operation of these governance programs in China? What are their interests in, in sustainability and governance and how they can shape businesses' incentives to adopt new rules and standards? And therefore, uh, I draw on the existing literature on transnational governance, um, not only in China, but also in other contexts, but also the literature on Chinese politics, trying to understand the government, the institutional government, sorry, institutionalize the governance processes in China. And here, this uh, graph uh, shows my theoretical framework. It's a bit complex uh, here, but let me just uh, explain in a very uh, simple way. So basically, uh, drawing on existing literature, I identify three types of uh, main drivers for the uptake or um, 
the, the, the adoption of transnational governance uh, in a new context, especially in, a, in the context of emerging economies like China. The, the first one is the transnational market agents, uh, which means buyers or uh, investors based in the global north, they are likely to feel more pressure to adopt sustainability rules or standards. And because of the, the global nature of their supply chains, they are likely to require their suppliers or subsidiaries based in and global in the global south uh, or emerging economies to adopt some rules. Um, however, uh, in the case of a fast growing emerging economy, the quick expansion of domestic uh, markets uh, put this uh, mechanism into questions because we want to know to what extent the northern uh, companies still have a large influence uh, over uh, local businesses uh, in emerging economies. And the second type of drivers is uh, it's transnational governance programs themselves and also the NGOs that support them because they can also uh, influence directly uh, the businesses' decisions through some public campaigns. Um, that said, in the case of China, uh, because of the special state and market relationships, state society relationships, uh, NGOs are very unlikely to adopt a, a very um, active role in terms of launching campaigns and also uh, through some boycotts. So in that sense, we want to know whether these actors still have some space and to influence, although it seems very unlikely. Therefore, I think what this framework expect that we should also put more um, attention to the so-called domestic actors, especially the state actors, according to uh, the previous literature. Uh, however, this sounds kind of counterintuitive in the case of China because we have mentioned the authoritarian nature of the uh, of the of the, the, the local context, and um, therefore we have to look at um, the spe specific nature of the, the, the Chinese governance, uh, the state governance, and try to recognize uh, the fragmented nature within the large bureaucracy uh, in the Chinese government. In that sense, uh, we could still expect maybe some actors in this state bureaucracies would have interest in supporting um, transnational governance, uh, especially in the case of uh, sustainability governance. And, and more specifically, um, during on the past literature, focusing on China, I identified two types of uh, state actors uh, that are likely to have interest in transnational governance. The first one is national industry associations. In the Western context, they are considered as uh, non-state actors, but in China, these associations are affiliated to often with uh, uh, Ministry level agents, government agencies, and they have huge influence in the policy making processes, um, but also uh, influence over the market with special links to businesses. Um, and they are they might be interested in transnational governance if those rules and standards can help the companies uh, in their sectors, uh, for example, to, to introduce some reforms to upgrading their production methods. Uh, the second type of uh, state actors who might be interested in transnational governance in China are um, subnational governments, uh, including uh, provincial and city level governments, and they might be interested in supporting um, companies in their jurisdiction to, about, to adopt new rules and standards if those rules and standards can provide some business benefits to, to them. Uh, so in that sense, there may be still a, a chance for domestic state actors to play an important role uh, in the uptake processes of transna transnational governance in China. However, um, the, the interest of these actors are not given in that sense, uh, there, there, there need a source of information. There is a need of uh, having providing information to these actors to make them aware and gradually get interested in transnational rules. In that sense, this framework also emphasizes the dynamic interactions among different actors, especially between transnational actors and also uh, and, the tra and domestic state actors. Uh, so this is basically how um, the framework was established. Um, and with that framework, I um, conduct a comparative uh, studies across three uh, agricultural commodity chains in China, uh, which are seafood, palm oil, and tea. And 
all these three commodities um, have a very important environmental and social impact, and with China play an important role in the relevant global markets. But more importantly, or more interestingly, they also vary uh, in the market and institutional context in the case of China, uh, in terms of the the degree of dependence on northern markets, uh, which would condition uh, the degree to which the transnational market or northern market agents can influence adoption of transnational standards uh, in China, but also the, in terms of domestic uh, institutions or domestic um, governance structures, uh, because um, they have they, they are regulated by different agencies and the structure of regulations also varies. Um, and that means also the influence of large agribusinesses. And this, this means these, uh, three, these three sectors or commodities um, constitute um, a good sample to test my theoretical framework uh, to allow the variations across uh, different uh, potential drivers to assess whether they actually play a role uh, in the uptake of transnational sustainability governance in China. And in my comparative studies, I compare not only um, across the three sectors, but also when in certain sectors, there are more than one program. I also look at the strategy of different programs to see how their activity and strategies uh, explain the variation um, among different programs. And also at the firm level, if the data is available, I also try to look at uh, how uh, the, the firm made their decisions in terms of uh, engaging or adopting transnational standards. So just a, a, a very quick uh, word about the data. Uh, so this is a mixed method research. Uh, so on, on one end, I did intensive uh, field work uh, mostly in China to conduct interview with practitioners representing different types of uh, stakeholders, including businesses, certification programs, uh, NGOs, and also government agencies. Um, and I also, through my, during my field work, uh, through my networks, I also tried to participate in stakeholder meetings and uh, had visit with some um, organizations in the production site to talk uh, with directly with, uh, with producers, for example, or farmers. Uh, and when, on the other end, when the data is available, when there is existing survey data at the firm level, or when there is a possibility to conduct surveys by myself in collaborations with some local researchers. I also use firm level survey data to investigate the factors that can motivate Chinese companies to adopt transnational certification standards. So here are some photos uh, that I took during my field work. Again, I'd like to thank uh, all people who agreed to be interviewed by me, also who helped me uh, through this uh, uh, research process. So um, we can, yeah. I was going to say, maybe we can pause here and yeah. um, turn to you again about a question I had in mind, because so far you already answered pretty much all the questions I had in mind already, um, including your um, day, I mean, case selection and yeah. um, how you got interested in the topic and all. Um, but while seeing this slide, I noticed how extensive the project was in terms of the, I mean, particularly the qualitative data you collected, 106 interviews, that's huge. Uh, so the question I had in mind was, what were the challenges you faced while scheduling these interviews and um, making, of course, the data available then in your book? Um, did you face any challenges when, um, persuading people to give you interviews. And um, again, I'm just building on all the, the pain and suffering I myself went through <laughs> when I was doing interviews uh, for my projects. Uh, of course, I mean, we really appreciate the help we get, but it's sometimes tricky to also um, get these interviews on record and, uh, you know, keep most of the, um, well, at least I assume that's the case um, in, in our field, mostly anonymous 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's something we try to uh, respect, but it's it's really tricky to do that. Could we talk a little bit about that aspect um, of, of the book? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, we all know this is a uh, this is always a very challenging process, like getting uh, people um, understand your research and support and be yeah, part of it to participate, especially uh, with your, your, your respondents. And uh, in my case, I think at the beginning, I wasn't sure when I started if I can reach out to all potential stakeholders. So I need to start from somewhere. And uh, yeah, often I'm, I'm trying to be strategic so to see for example these governance these certification programs because they have a strong interest in people doing research also yeah to kind of also help them to 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 expand the market so i think they would be happy to talk to me i tried just contact them without um, yeah being introduced by anyone else but then also through them trying to in the meantime through like a desk research trying to understand the, the stakeholder map and also through through a like more like snowballing approach to get uh, um, reach to other people, but I think what I would say the most important thing is just try to be uh, proactive and uh, yeah without fear and always ask people but even even now. But then I think gradually you know it's not that a, a big world. So I think even often in a, in a field people working on this, so for example on the CSR or sustainability governance, it's a small field. People know each other. And uh, yeah, I think that you have to build the trust. It's 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 a long process. I think that's that, in that sense. I think be staying in the field, being there for a while, it's really helpful. I know that was challenging during the COVID time because I think I also did some online interview later, but not for this project. But I I, I could imagine it's very difficult for people to understand, especially even if you can you turn on your camera you see each other but it's not the same when you you are you are in the same room but as you could see these photos i, I even didn't know these people some of them are local researchers some of them are local ngos and i got to know them and ask if uh, i could yeah be part of their trips if we do some trips sometimes sometimes they also organize uh, field trips for me just because I want to visit some businesses, some local, some, for example, farmers, some farmer organizations, do they help me a lot? That's fantastic. I mean, I was never offered such trips, but then my work was on the IMF, so. Yeah. <laughs> that. That's different. I think um, there are always pros and cons. For example, international organizations, they, they should be transparent. So I think they have um, the mandate to, 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 to be open to researchers. But as um, on the other hand, because they, these are people who it relatively have a higher uh, social status and they are busy. So I think sometimes they just ignore your, your request. I still appreciate that I got to interview a lot of people, of course, at the IMF, but I mean, I shouldn't, of course, expect them to give me a tour of <laughs> the IMF building or something in lines of that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there is a pros and cons, and, and I, I was going to ask the same question to you. If you were to conduct this research during COVID times, what challenges you think you would face? But you already answered that as well. Um, interviews, online interviews are also not so easy in terms of scheduling. And again, you don't really get the same um, atmosphere that you yeah. have in, in, in prison. The other thing I might want to add here is because uh, in this case, I study sustainability standards. There are also a lot of technical details that I don't understand. And then I think talking to experts, specialists uh, in specific fields is always helpful. And also sometimes that's why they offer me some field trips because then they can show me the production sites and talk to farmers to know because when we talk about, for example, like a, a, a tea plantation, a coffee plantation, you know, oh, you need to protect biodiversity, but you don't know what are the specific issues. When when they brought me to the field, they could show me as well. So and also to to we could discuss to what extent these standards are applicable or not in in a specific context. Do we also get snippets of these in the book or like somewhere? Yeah, there are some, but not that, not the technical details because yeah. this is not about, but for me, it's oh, really like a very enriching experience to understand this. And also I think as a, as a first the large project, I think give me a lot of idea about what I want to do next. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Uh, we can, of course, continue with. Yeah, I think I'm going to just give a quick summary of the key empirical findings, and then maybe yeah, some some thoughts, some some insights uh, based on the findings. Should I continue? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. So now let's uh, come back and to see what's what's uh, the the results of my my comparison across the three commodity sectors, and as we can see here, um, in terms of the business support or the 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 degree of uh, um, uptake of certified products, there is a variation across the three commodity chains. In the case of seafood, we can see that eco certification or sustainable seafood certification actually has uh, risen in China. So really got interested in by many businesses, not only those who want to export to European markets, for example, but also a lot of domestic companies who focus really on domestic market, growing domestic high-end seafood markets, especially, and also some um, e-commerce giants in China. They also made a sourcing commitment on source only certified products by some time. So that was uh, unbelievable for many practitioners a few years ago, but. Why this is the case, I'm going to show you in a bit, but then in comparison, we could see in the case of palm oil, the, the supply chain structure is different. So China is a purely import of palm oil, mostly to supply domestic consumption, which means there's less uh, external influence um, in this case. And the, the, the uptake is weaker, um, but still stronger than the case of tea. So in the case of tea, although China is the world's largest uh, tea producer and consumer, uh, so transnational certifications uh, uh, has barely uh, get um, into this market. Um, and why this is the case, even if we look at the, the transnational market forces, they, they play an interesting and important role at the beginning to introduce these programs to Chinese producers. Um, almost across all three cases. But actually, if we look at the, the subsequent development of transnational standards uh, in these cases, uh, these transnational uh, businesses or, or, or their influence not really play a very important role. So what is more important is the, the kind of endorsement of some actors in the Chinese state. In the case of seafood, it was a leading uh, Seafood Industry Business Association, uh, who really got interested in using transnational standards to upgrade the Chinese seafood industry, also brand uh, some big companies or big uh, um, big brands, uh, not only in China but also internationally, but also to rebuild the reputation of seafood uh, among the Chinese consumers because there was a lot of food safety issues in China. Uh, also in the, the seafood case. So in that sense, this uh, national industry associations play a huge role in introducing and encouraging businesses to use transnational standards. And similarly, this also happened in the case of uh, of palm oil with the trade associations, mainly through the engagement of uh, some uh, Western organizations uh, like WWF uh, and also certification from the roundtable on sustainable palm oil. Uh, they, they, they work on some projects to introduce a transnational certification programs to Chinese businesses. Although still, if we look at the, the amount of uh, certified palm oil import to China, uh, the, the amount, the absolute amount is still low, but now today in the, in the, in the industries, people become aware and know the certi certified palm oil, sustainable farm palm oil. And also there were some campaigns uh, in the business sectors, uh, for example, uh, in online, but also offline supermarkets uh, to consumers about certified sustainable palm oil. And, but this was not the case in, in, in the tea sector. Um, we had, seeing some cases of support from the local government, especially in the western part of China, uh, um, which is less wealthy than the coast, uh, the east coast. And uh, those governments really rely on agriculture and they want to use certification and to brand their local produced tea. But the scale of the project is still relatively small compared to the national market and the impact of those uh, 
support schemes remain to be seen. And as a result, there was not uh, a momentum uh, on certification uh, or sustainable tea certification in China. So basically, uh, here are um, some key insights from uh, these empirical uh, findings. Uh, first, as we could observe, that even in authoritarian mark, uh, authoritarian context, some state actors in China would be still interested in uh, supporting transnational uh, governance programs. Uh, in this case, the state-sponsored industry associations, although they were seen as non-state actors in the Western context, they actually play a kind of quasi-state actor role uh, in providing very important support for the spread of transnational certification uh, in China. And what we also try to dive into the incentives of these state actors, we could see that they lend their support for transnational rules, mostly to achieve their own development goals, for example, to promote or reform the industries. Um, and also implement sometimes, in some cases, uh, the national government plan on sustainable development. If they see the links, they could also claim that providing um, policy and also sometimes uh, financial support for business to adopt transnational rules is a type of way to implement uh, sustainable development policies identified by, by the national government. And, uh, but what it's also important from a perspective of transnational programs uh, is that in order to gain support of these influential domestic, domestic stakeholders, they need to actively or proactively engage with um, their potential allies in the Chinese state. And they need to also understand the, the, the domestic uh, regulatory framework, the, the regulatory landscape, and to see what could be these potential allies, what are the opportunities to, to, to collaborate collaborate to engage with them. So this is the findings on China. And then in the last chapter of, uh, of the book, I also quickly review another three cases um, to see if these findings uh, can be also valid in other emerging economy contexts. I look at the, the soil certification in Brazil, tea certification in India, and the fishery certification in Russia, because these are also important as commodities uh, governed by some certification programs in these emerging economies. So basically, I found uh, a lot, several important commonalities across uh, emerging economies. The first one is that uh, there is a, a strong trend of South-South uh, trade and, and also the, the growth in terms of the growth of domestic consumption. This means the influence of Northern-based uh, market agents or Northern businesses on the adoption of transnational sustainability standards in emerging economies will continue to decrease. And that means also we should turn uh, more attention to the role played by domestic stakeholders. And if when we when I reviewed these cases in other emerging economies, we actually see both industry associations and the regulatory agencies play an important role in determining, determining uh, sustainability governance uh, in these countries, uh, including whether or not they want to engage in sustainability governance and whether or not they want to work with transnational programs to promote some new standards and rules. Uh, Unfortunately, while also we look at what happened uh, in terms of engagement between transnational programs and domestic stakeholders, actually there wasn't enough engagement uh, there. And, and part, partly uh, as a result of this, um, there, is also, there was also a growing interest of some uh, domestic, especially state actors in developing their own um, standards or governance programs uh, or certification programs to complement or even replace some transnational rules. And the, the, the main claims in this new um, process or new dynamic is that uh, the rules that are homegrown, as I put here, uh, can better reflect the local conditions and uh, which maybe get more market support in uh, their, their countries. And so what this would tell, and I think we could see the important, uh, importance of interactions between state and non-state actors. And uh, there is also 
a recognition that in emerging economies, we really need to turn more attention to the, the role played by domestic, especially state actors. And what would be the future? Uh, when I finish the book in the very, very last section, so I'm trying to see what could happen in terms of the state interventions in emerging economies um, in transnational governance um, or non-state um, market-based governance. I actually uh, identify three scenarios. The first one is a kind of undifferentiated support by the state. As we could see, this is more like what happened in China in the seafood case, the governments, uh, or in this case, state-supported industry associations provided support to all transnational programs without differentiating them. And th this actually could lead to rapid growth in terms of the uptake, uh, the, the, the amount or the proportion of certified products. But there is also risk of greenwashing because there is in, in, the, in the large party of literature on transnational governance, um, we have seen that the different programs or standards and in terms of their credibility, their stringencies, there is a huge variation there. So if we don't differentiate them, although on paper, it looks like there is a rapid growth in terms of the, the, the amount of certified products, but that doesn't mean that the business practice have been uh, um, significantly changed. That doesn't mean that we will see a significant impact on environmental or social outcomes. Uh, the second scenario, which would be ideal, is a careful steering of the state uh, in using or supporting transnational governance. However, this is uh, very challenging um, because uh, this requires the trust to build between these, those domestic stakeholders, especially state stakeholders, uh, and the transnational non-state actors. And they also requires this uh, actors in emerging economies to, to understand uh, the rulemaking processes and also spe some specific standards and, and the culture behind this uh, transnational governance. And, and of course, as we discussed, there is also a trend of having these homegrown governance initiatives led by southern state actors. Um, this may not mean a bad thing in a sense that if this initiative can create uh, cred credible uh, governance systems, which can be even more impactful than existing transnational governance in transforming the mainstream uh, market, especially when the state use their, 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 their authority or their capacities to promote um, better practices. Um, however, um, this seems also a long process. There are also a lot of homegrown initiatives happening right now, but to what extent they, they can be impactful and really transform the market? And this is still a question. And also I'm, I'm hoping to do more research in the future on this end. Just to conclude, uh, the overall, I think the book sheds light on the influence of domestic stake actors on the operation of transnational governance in emerging economies. Um, and we could see that although eco-certification is not a panacea for our ecological climate crisis, it is likely to still play a role or a relatively quite important role in sustainability transition of, of uh, emerging economies in foreseeable futures. Therefore, I hope this book is just a, a start to, to, to to, to promote this new research agenda on public and private governance interactions, uh, especially in non-Western context. And also, I hope we could see also more cases in other countries like Turkey. So yeah, I think I'll stop here and uh, yeah, happy to uh, take some questions. But before I finish, I just want to remind you that the book is published uh, as open access, um, you can get access and download the ebook at the, the website of MIT Press. So thanks to the, the kind support of Swiss National Science Foundation. Of course, if you want to get a paper version, um, yeah, there is a discount code here and just order on, on Penguin Random House. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and I mean, well, I, that's what I'm gonna do right after the, the seminar. Yeah. I, I really need to uh, uh, read this book. It's really inspirational and great contribution uh, to the literature.
And I mean, as I said, I mean, you answered all the questions I had in mind pretty much, but I still have some questions about the writing process. So before I open the floor um, for Q&A, maybe I can use my um, moderator privileges and ask the questions I have. Um, so my first question is about, since this is an academic book that um, at, I mean, comes from your PhD project, um, how was the process of, in a way, converting the book into, I mean, converting the PhD thesis into a book format? Um, did you try to write your thesis, you having in mind that you're gonna publish it as a book and wrote the, the dissertation accordingly, which is something we all dream to do, but it's really difficult to do that. Or did you end up finishing your PhD and then transforming the dissertation into a book? Yeah, good question. So I think this is probably a question that every PhD wants to ask. And uh, yeah, actually, I, 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 I think I, I have to admit that I had uh, in mind when I started, but yeah, I think it's yeah, quite an early stage of my PhD that I wanted to, to write a book and uh, get this published. So not just a dissertation, uh, yeah, I think stay in a library, but also I want to publish a book that um, can be accessible to everyone. But of course, I think that was just an idea and uh, to make that happen, it, it was a long process. Uh, as I wrote in my acknowledgement, I actually worked for more than seven years uh, to get this done as a book. Um, I was yeah. going to be the other question I was going to ask you already again, <laughs> answered it, uh, how long it took you to uh, complete the entire project. It's about seven years. Yeah, I would say about seven years. So yeah, let me just uh, give you a bit more details on that. Then I think then I, I have to think about how I design as a book. So that's why I came with kind of ambitious project with all these three commodity chains, supply chains. And then you also have to want to get into details using like firm level data, look at specific firm cases. So you have multiple levels of analysis. So it was quite challenging, but try, I try to make that happen. And But I always uh, yeah, keep this in mind that I want to have a book and uh, and yeah, although I, I, I also published something using some materials I, I got from my field work as journal articles, but still want to keep some important things in the book. And when I finished my PhD, uh, I started to, to, to have some conversations with potential publishers and also yeah, editors. Uh, I was lucky, I think so many people got interested in this project and uh, yeah, provide important support to me. And then you have to write uh, like a book proposal to the publisher. And they also advised me to, to read some, uh, there was a book actually about how, how to turn your dissertation into a book. So I read that book. And uh, also I had, uh, during my postdoc at Yale, I had a, a book uh, um, workshop. So basically you have a full manuscript. I think this become more and more popular these days, especially in, in, in the US, Like you invite a couple of experts uh, in your field, uh, broadly speaking, and uh, yeah, you provide a full manuscript because this was based on my dissertation. I did some revision afterwards. And then I, sh I had a, a kind of initial full manuscript to, to share, to be shareable and uh, ask each of them to provide a written comment. But when, then we also had like a full day. Yeah, I think not, not eight hours, but maybe like five hours workshops. And uh, yeah, got a lot of use for feedback. And then I had to, yeah, luckily we had a research assistant to help me to, to, to take all notes. And then yeah, using these notes, I started the revision process before I submit the, the full manuscript. And uh, that alone, because I got a new job and moved to a new country. And then yeah, it took me another more than a year, I would say, to finish that. And then you, you sent for review, you got the, the review back and then I made some, but I didn't get, a, yeah, um, a lot of dif difficult comments. So it was relatively a smooth review process, but still I think you have to wait. So that took a, about another six months. So when we see, of course, the final product, uh, we, we are not aware of as you know, readers, 
um, what hard work has been actually put into producing that. And so um, our audience, we have a lot of students in our audience, I noticed. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is that when you do a contemporary research, research project on a contemporary topic like mine, you have to be in mind that like, you have to update data sometimes. And that was going to be my last question. You actually, <laughs> you feel, I feel like you're reading my mind already. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, seriously, I didn't give a list of questions uh, that I'll be asking. So it's not like um, Dr. Sun already had all the questions at hand. He's seriously reading my mind and answering all the questions I have. Um, that was going to be the question. I mean, because I mean, of course, we when we do PhD, um, we try to get you know, I mean, our lit reviews updated. But then uh, we always have this also, I guess, you know, like nervous moments of somebody writing something very close to what we did, and um, up, shall we update our project and research accordingly? Um, during that last year of writing the book, um, did you go through that? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, yeah, updating references is important. And uh, of course, I think uh, it's not, it's, yeah, I know the crowds, I know yeah, what has been published recently. It's not a, a, a very challenging task in that sense, but you need to keep a, your eye on uh, recent development. But also when I talk, when I mention about the data, it's also about sometimes things happened in terms of the empirical uh, data. And then, for example, I, I want to use trade data. Also, I want to add, because I think when I finished, that was 2018. Then in the book, I add I update it until to 2020. So I think that means it's not too outdated. So this kind of things you need to do as well. So in the kind of last stage. But I did also when, when I revised the book. So yeah. Um, yeah, and also I think if something happens, so you, you want to make sure the argument, the argument is always valid. So if there are some 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 shocks happen, I think that could be, yeah, that that could be worrying in in, in a sense that uh, yeah, if it counteract your arguments. But yeah, I think that was not the case uh, of mine. But this is something we have to bear in mind. Absolutely. That recently happened to uh, me and my co-author rewriting this chapter uh, for a book that's on, well, let's say, Turkish economy in general. And so, you know, things have been quite fickle here. So we had to actually revisit everything we said about, um, you know, our projections about the future. But um, it is it is tricky, of course. But it's it's also really also exciting, I guess. You know what what's lie what lies ahead and um, the further projects that you will be um, sharing us sharing with us, I guess, um, built on the book. Uh, maybe I should pause here and turn to our audience to collect questions uh, or comments if they want. Um, you can just type them in the chat box and I can read them out loud because um, we're recording this session and it will become available online. Um, so let me see. Might take a while to, to get them. Still warming up, I guess. Yeah, I think I, yeah, just... I, just yes. to follow up your, your last comment, I think in general, I think we, we should, I mean, as long as we, 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 we did our research in a very rigorous way, it was carefully designed uh, and supported by robust data and research process. I mean, I think we shouldn't worry too much that if something happened and uh, that will invalidate your argument completely. It's just there are some recent development that you might need to also mention. So. Yeah, in that sense, I think it's just it's about updating, adding, for example, some anecdotal evidence, these kind of things. But uh, yeah, it's just also trying to to think of what happened. So that's also I got a lot of questions when I finished the book, or even um, I show my book to some some experts in my field. Uh, I often got asked that uh, what would be the next. So these kind of questions. So if there are some yeah emerging trends with some 
specific examples then you would like to add if possible but of course i think at some point you have to finish you, you want to get this and to the to the publisher and so i think it's just i think we need to to think and if there's something interesting you want to mention we could always add to to any project absolutely i mean and uh, you're absolutely right about um getting the word published at some point um is important because we can always add more and then it leads to this you know loop of when am i going to publish this oh there is this i need to add um and we keep doing that as scholars sometimes we just sit on our work and always want to make it like you know better but uh we should also share of course our findings with our audiences and again, I mean, research or books with a lot of prediction about the future are a little risky, maybe, uh, rather than doing that, um, just publishing what we have, giving the projections and um, waiting for what comes next is, is a good way to go. Um, so we have a question from Rihan Zhu. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, has two questions. One, what is the farmer's opinion on eco certification? And two, how um, has your research observed anything related to sustainable coffee governance and certification in China? Is it strong, moderate, or weak? Thank you. Good. I think this uh, very interesting questions. So let me just uh, follow in uh, the order to uh, to. Also, the first question about farmer's opinion. And uh, yeah, first of all, I have to admit that I didn't do any survey with farmers. I think that requires additional resources. And also the focus of this project is not on farmers. So mostly at the business level. So looking at the business uh, support. But uh, I did talk to farmers and uh, yeah, get some access. Um, I think uh, it depends because uh, if uh, it depends also on the market first, let's see, it depends on the market. If uh, in a market where certification become more and more mainstream, I think that might affect farmers, uh, which means if they don't do certified production, and that, 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 that will put them in a very uh, disadvantaged position. That happened in many, I think, not necessarily in China in these cases, but in many developing countries. And also getting certified requires um, additional resources uh, and the capacity. So not necessarily you have to pay for audits, but also you have to be trained and uh, yeah, like following, you have to have certain capacity knowledge to follow some standards and rules. And uh, yeah, for farmers, I think it depends if they get incentives um, they are likely to do, but of course you might get some opposition. So I talked to some people, some businesses, especially in the case of tea, that they do training with farmers. So if you, you pay farmers and invite them to, to come to training, and also you don't ask them to to pay for audits so you cover the cost and then they they are interested in, in participating and then of course i think it depends on the benefits at the end so if the their income increases um, by selling more certified products they are they are likely to support that happened in some cases i did some yeah, very um Micro level, micro level case studies looking at some companies so they develop kind of a governance system within uh, the companies because they do management vertical management and down to farmers and try to provide incentives to farmers and uh, always encouraging farmers to uh, to, to also voice their concerns and also listen to them. And so they have field manage, managers to, 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 to be very close to farmers. And in that case, that was quite successful. Uh, but of course, in some cases, I also talked to other companies, they, they don't uh, have a very coherent system. They do some trainings and uh, ask farmers to do this and that, but, but then they said that it was difficult to, to get farmers uh, uh, on board because they don't see direct benefits. So it needs time to build the kind of system and also trust. So I think, yeah, that's that's an important, um, also an important finding I would say. And also I think if people want to do more research at the, the, the farmer level, I think there are a lot of things to be done, especially in the case of China. Um, yeah, 
with uh, with the trend that in China there's less and less farmers, people are moving to uh, urban areas, and then I think there is a, a shortage of workforce uh, in, uh, in 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 rural areas in the agriculture sector. So I think yeah, there there will be a, a a very promising research topic, I would say. And in terms of the coffee, um, because China is not a major coffee producer, um, and uh, I've been working with a lot, uh, um, lot of colleagues and friends who specialized in coffee certification. And uh, yeah, so China is important coffee, more and more important coffee consumer right now as a country. So the question becomes, I think the more, relevant question would be to what extent Chinese consumers would like to pay for certified coffee. I would say it's not that um, in terms of uh, consumer awareness of certification, it's not that popular yet, but you can see already in some coffee shops, the logos of some certification problem are there now. That was already like back to three years ago when I was in China last time because of the pandemic, I couldn't go back. But I, from what I read uh, on media, there, there are more and more. And when I talk to, to people in the field, uh, in, in the business sector, so it's, it's an emerging trend. And uh, yeah, I would love to do more consumer research. So we did surveys with consumer on tea, but not on coffee. But I think there is a, is a rising awareness and the willingness to pay as well. It's growing, but to, the problem is also whether consumers understand what means those labors. So whether they want to pay for more, for example, even just a little bit more, but is that worthwhile? So I think we would like to see. But I think for, for younger generation in general, generally speaking, um, they, they, they understand, they agree that they need to, there is a, there's a need to address the sustainability challenges um, in those agriculture sectors, the impact of their consumption. So I think what we really need to see is whether uh, this knowledge will trans translate into behavior. I think that would be an important question. Thank you so much. Um, there is two more questions in the chat box, so I'll read them out loud. Um, first one from Hugh Speechley. Is there a tension between state support for certification, which are likely to increase prices, and state policies of food security and common prosperity? Okay, yeah, that's, uh, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, tension. Um, in terms of price, the relationship is not that always straightforward because one state provides support and not necessarily that means the, the price will increase. Uh, so often it's a kind of support. I talk, I, I refer to mostly that policy support to remove some policy barriers for those trans transnational governance programs to be able to, to work with Chinese companies and to, to help Chinese companies to adopt, to, 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 to train those business managers to understand what do they need to do. And sometimes there, there, is a, there, there are some financial incentives to, for example, cover the auditing cost. Um, but uh, yeah, the price, I, I don't think there is a, a, a direct relationship that we can observe. Uh, uh, or, or very straight relationship in that sense. So for, from a business perspective, as long as they, they are not asked to cover the cost from the Chinese business perspective, uh, they will be happy. Uh, so if they get support and they don't cover the cost, um, and uh, yeah, and then of course, I think they want to buy a sell uh, products with a higher price. So if they get certification, they don't cover the cost, but they sell how higher with a higher price, they see the benefits. And uh, yeah, the but whether or not that will translate into the market price, I think it's more about, uh, again, I think that gets back to the question of cons consumers willingness to pay. And uh, I think this is uh, uh, important areas uh, for future research, I would say, because we are, we are doing also, uh, my personally with, uh, with a lot of collaborators, we have a couple of projects on that. And uh, yeah, the question is also if in terms of the support, then we get back to the state support, those, for example, subsidies, 
consumers are not aware of if the government provides support to companies or not in many cases. Uh, so, yeah, I think the question is also about, for example, the, the political support for such uh, uh, financial incentives provided by the government. And uh, I think do you have a kind of a sub question about food security and common prosperity. I would say this, this, there's a relationship to this kind of the common prosperity policy uh, in a sense that uh, if we we use we adopt better practices by in, in the production processes everyone can benefit especially for example for farmers and uh, other 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 actors in the supply chain uh, often those actors are not very powerful not big businesses but also like um, traders and um, intermediates um, yeah all these people all these stakeholders so this is why some local governments they provide support to transnational programs as by claiming that these programs can help them to develop can help those areas uh, those rural areas especially to 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 develop so i think that this is how the state actors use transnational rules in the case of china in a very strategic way to link uh, the agenda of those transnational actors with the domestic policy agenda yes i think that's why i think this is we this is the reason we need to really understand the incentive of these state actors and to see yeah what even if we can observe the the the, the interesting is they support transnational rules to why this is the case um, and to what extent this is driven by the agenda of sustainability or sustainable development. So I think that's a fascinating question. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from Elam Gunar. Uh, you mentioned homegrown initiatives can have the power of transforming the mainstream market. In this case, what is the possible strategy to transform the markets if the state capacity is weak? Which role can the non-state actors play here? And lastly, how do you define state capacity from the transnational governance perspective? Okay, thank you very much, um, Alan. Uh, several questions here. And um, yes, so let me start with homegrown initiatives. Um, yeah, I kind of alluded to the, the potential of homegrown initiatives. Of course, it's still debatable. Uh, actually, um, we, we did a special issue. Uh, so finally finished last year, uh, sustainable commodity governance in the global south. So there are several papers in that special issue uh, is looking at homegrown actually look at the homegrown initiatives. And uh, we could see yeah, in some cases, uh, uh, these are mostly um, driven by state actors, but not always. So in some cases, they are also driven by non-state actors in the global south, uh, because they see the limits or limitations of transnational rules. Uh, a mo lot of rules, they are not applicable. Uh, they not really get buy-in by local producers. So in some cases, local, uh, for example, farming communities or civil societies, they see a need uh, to develop something that, that is more adaptable to local context. And of course, I think if there is a strong state capacity, uh, you could leverage that capacity to, to introduce uh, some homegrown initiative or rules and transform the mainstream market. Um, but uh, of course, I think this is not always the case, uh, especially in many developing countries. But because the nature of being homegrown, some rules, uh, as I mentioned, could fit better local context. In that sense, even without a state capacity, they may still have a, um, a, a better prospect than transnational governance to be adopted by or to be supported by uh, local uh, producers. So, of course, I think we need more empirical research. So now this uh, research agenda is still mainly based on um, case studies, so different uh, case studies. I think I would like to see if we can do some more systematic analysis. Um, but yeah, I agree. So state capacity is important, but uh, whether or not it is a, a sufficient condition, I think that's something we need to see um, 
I know especially based on more examples, more cases. And, and then let me just move to your next question about, uh, yeah, I think I kind of already answered the role of non-state actors. It's about the definition of state capacity from transnational governance perspective. And uh, yeah, I think state capacity in political science, we have some standard definition. Uh, in this case, um, from the perspective of transnational governance programs, um, it depends, I think it's still the same definition. I wouldn't say there is a different, def different definition there, but the question or the, the, the the, the interest of transnational governance is how states uh, will interact or would interact with them, uh, how states um, can support them. So the question would be, uh, if states want to intervene, would that undermine their authority? And also, this is not also not just the case in authoritarian contexts like China, but even in European Union. So my colleague, uh, Stefan Rankins uh, at the uh, University of Toronto published his book on European Union's intervention in uh, certification programs, uh, 2020, I think, yeah, end of 2020. So we could see a lot of uh, interesting um, development from the very beginning, even 1990s, when lots of certification programs were created. So how the European Union see a strategic interest in those programs, how they provide support. But of course, when they see uh, yeah, their interests that, that don't align with some programs, they would like to support maybe competing programs, also yeah, develop some national regulation or do not use national, um, like, national or state regulations to support those private rules. So it's always about the strategy and the interest of the state. So whether uh, they would like to leverage the, the capacity, uh, especially the, the in, in this case, the rule making authority um, to, to intervene into transnational governance. I hope that answers your question, but if not, please feel free to, to type more. I think it actually answered, but uh, Elam, if you have any further questions, I think, yeah, that, that actually covered. Um, we're almost approaching the end of um, the talk for today. Um, if there are any further questions, of course, you can always feel free to, uh, to message Dr. Sun. I think we shared his email address with you. Yeah. Um, also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you very much again. Uh, it was a fantastic book talk, a great kickoff to the, the uh, new book club we uh, organize at here at Koch University Globam Center. And um, again, for those of you who would like to have a hard copy, uh, don't forget to use a 10% uh, code that, um, that was shared. Thank you again for that as well. Fresh from MIT Press, very much looking forward to, to reading it thoroughly. And um, with that, um, I will stop recording in a bit. Um, any last points you wanted to add? Um, I'll give the floor back to you for, for um, the, the okay. final words. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. I just want to thank everyone who, who came to today's talk and uh, yeah. And it was my great pleasure to be here and to be the first speaker of this book club. And yeah, I wish uh, all the best for the rest of the, the, book, the book club. Thank you so much. Um, so next in line, we have another exciting book talk for those of you uh, who will be attending that. We will um, share the details hopefully soon. Um, and until then, Wishing you all, for those of you who are in Istanbul, um, a safe weekend, uh, try to stay home. Uh, and um, those who are across the pond, thank you so much for joining us during such late, at, early in the morning, I guess, for you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And feel free to get in touch.